Our first reaction, well, at, first of all, Toshiko told us that she had, you know, suggested us for the list. So, of course, we were really excited. But then when we got the email, we thought, this is spam, <laughs> fake design. This is this is really suspicious. Uh, but we, you know, knowing that you know um, Toshiko had put us on the list, we were expecting it. So um, I think we um, had the same doubts that we have with any project. You know, is it going to be real or not? And so you know that that was the doubt. But um, I think we trusted it from the beginning. So yeah, I have a slightly different um, memory of how it happened. Yeah, Toshiko told us, like, so I put you on this list for a villa in, you know, Mongolia, and I thought, great, but we get so many of these, you know, possible projects that the idea of trusting a, you know, a situation is, is one that slowly changes, you know, as we find out more, so we've been out there in all kinds of, you know, potential situations, but the first email we got was actually from Herzog and Amaron's office saying, okay, so you're approved on the list, that was a few months later. It wasn't until December that Fake finally started emailing everybody. But we actually did know Fake's work. I mean, it published. We had a book on, you know, architecture in Beijing and stuff like that. We had seen stuff by Fake. So I think at that point we, we actually did know. I knew of fake, fake Design's work. I actually didn't know that they were connected to Ai Weiwei. And I thought they were a young architectural firm because, you know, we'd seen their work published. Um, but. I think the extent to which we see this work in the context of Ai Weiwei's work is really just a partial reading and one that's become less and less important to, I think, the participating architects as the project has evolved on its own terms. Um, his, you know, influence on the project in terms of the kind of the organization of it is obviously crucial and, and really one that we're uh, very grateful uh, to because I think rather than hiring a few stellar, or star, you know, star name architects and, and giving it up in a very different way, um, his idea of an art project at the scale of an urban situation actually translates into a huge set of opportunities for a lot of architects and one that maybe will result in a much more interesting project at an architectural level. So I think it's maybe it starts out as an art construct, but its result is kind of urban and approximates the kind of adjacencies you would get in a city designed by many architects at some level, but then retains the kind of the structure, I think, of a, a really powerful sort of statement. So, we have to read it as his work to some extent, but I also think that it's now taking a life of its own. We, yeah, it's just pretty hard to, you know, get, get a handle on 10,000 square feet and, and to kind of, you know, without having a specific client understand how someone would use that. Um, we thought about a couple of things. Uh, we thought about the extreme climate. Um, and we thought about how one would, you know, effectively use a house of that size. Um, and so we came up with a thermal logic that responded to um, the extreme climate. So our house has an inner house that is more compact, and that's the essential house. And then it has an outer house, which, you know, you use in more temperate weather. So it's an idea of living that expands and contracts um, as the seasons change. And that for us was a response that was grounded in the, you know, in the site. Although there was nothing physical about the site that we really uh, responded to, because we were told that, you know, the sand dunes and all the topography that you see, don't worry about it. It's going yeah. to be flattened. To a large extent, Completely. we were we were very influenced by fake design, to be honest. We visited Kaochangdi, the area in which um, Ai Weiwei has a studio, and um, one of my former Parsons students is part of Fake Design, and we had lunch with a bunch of them, and they directed us to see some of the galleries in that area, and it's, it's a really lovely, low-key, bohemian sort of area of Beijing, and it's just grey brick on the outside, red brick paint white on the inside, exposed concrete frame, but, you know, some really bold moves, large surfaces, and we were humbled by also the speed and the simplicity with which they just designed and built those things. I mean, they boast that they designed and built their main compound in, f what is it, 40 days? Um, <laughs> that's how long it takes us to negotiate a contract. But, <laughs> you know? And so we thought, gosh, and then they were very clear about the budget, actually. Um, they showed us, well, this is what 1,000 renminbi per square meter costs. Fake designs villas or, or um, galleries cost, you know, maybe 1,200. In, in this context, you have 2,000. So we thought, well, great, we can do a little bit better. Um, you know, 
and we need to because we're providing many different amenities and so on. It's not a gallery, but we can't. Uh, we have to be very uh, strict with ourselves and do something that they know how to build that we can design from very far away and will come out successfully. So we work very, very much within those contexts. We, we wanted a really powerful concept um, that could be very simply translated in drawings um, and, 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 and that didn't rely on um, our kind of typical high intensity kind of level of detailing because we're not going to be there and we need to and, and also we wanted to draw it in such a way that it didn't require so many notes, you know, knowing that every single note that you have on the page has to be translated into Chinese. So we wanted to kind of really streamline it, um, have as few details as possible. Um, so, you know, we, we you know, really try to find a really powerful concept that could be reduced, you know, and this inner house, outer house thing for us was a way of saying, okay, the outer house is all X, uh, type of materials and the inner house is all Y kind of materials and and this is how they join together. Great. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, you know, we're quite happy with our project. We'll be even happier when we see it built. But um, it's been a very intense period in, in the office. We put our whole team on it. Um, we had a great team working on it. And I think that initially we were not sure about it. But when we went back for the second site visit, um, with our design in mind and with a kind of preliminary set of drawings and, and models in mind, we became more convinced that we had approached it in, a, in an appropriate way. But I want to try to answer the question on another level too. How do we feel about our participation in the project um, in terms of, you know, some of the polemics that have surrounded it in terms of, uh, you know, the idea of an architect working abroad in, in another country that has a different set of issues. Um, within the spectrum of things that have been going on in China, we've just been increasingly convinced that this is this is a really positive one, a really unique one that is that has some flaws, of course, mainly in that it doesn't include Chinese architects. That's the one uh, huge disappointment for us. You know, we really would have seen this as a wonderful opportunity to meet other Chinese architects and exchange ideas. But and we understand why sort of Ai Weiwei's reasoning for that. He's he's making a critical statement as to the level of architecture in China, which you know. It's, that's his opinion, I guess. Um, but it's also part of his sort of setup as an art project, putting 100 architects in the desert, you know, from abroad. Mm -hmm. But but you know, after all the furor that surrounded the Olympics and and, and you know a lot of the discussions surrounding projects and working in China, uh, we notice a kind of colonialism or sort of projection of uh, this idea that the state equals uh, the, the the people and that there's a sort of homogeneous monolithic entity out there, and then. It's really been eye-opening to go out there and realize that uh, China is a huge, complex society, and Beijing is a city struggling to, you know, emerge from decades of, of being a developing uh, nation, and, and they want just what everybody else has. And um, and you know, then to see that there's there's private, uh, you know, well, there are private companies, individuals, institutions, and of course there are huge political issues and problems, but um, we didn't feel that we were working within such a huge context politically and you know culturally when we were there we realized well it's just like any project it has downsides and issues and everything else but at least this is one where you know it's, it's quite laudable China's opening up in this case to a very large context it can only be positive we think I think the site plan is the best thing about the project I think that um, you know, putting very different architectural responses in such close proximity is, is, uni is a unique con uh, condition. One can't use any simple terms such as suburban or, or urban or even art project to, to uh, def describe this. I think we'll have to see how it actually works when, once it's built. But um, it, it's the best thing about the project, which is why we felt that it should be reinforced and supported uh, throughout and that architects, you know, as Mimi says, you know, produce a better or, or sort of urban regions when they respected the site plan. There was a lot of thought that went into it. Our initial reaction was that it was way too dense. It was, um, you know, 
wow, this is like a medieval city at some level. And it dawned on us that, that as the site plan or site model got filled up with models, that that was actually what made it unique. That, you know, perverse as it might seem, uh, the proximity of these buildings is precisely what makes it something different from a suburban condition. That actually public space is at a premium and it's tight and becomes supercharged through the close proximity of these monster houses. So I like that aspect. I'm, you know, I just wish they were smaller. I don't see why these houses had to be so big. And again, our response was precisely to make a smaller house within a simple shell, but that seems overblown. I don't know why anyone would want 10,000 square feet. I hope after, so. After Monday's crash? <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope so. I mean, I, I think that there are similar developments, but again, I think that um, the way that we're used to working, you know, um, there are more constraints. And I think it's a really interesting mix of, you know, uh, charging the architect to be responsible and engaging with the, with the constraints, mm -hmm. and then um, actually very little constraints, except for the fact that y y you have to, you know, make it work. You have to, you know, know what you're doing and make sure that it can, your ideas can be translated. I but think that it wouldn't happen in this way just because um, younger architects would not be trusted here. Well, I'm, I'm saying I hope so in, yeah. the, in, in the kind of like, you know, optimistic yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that is the amazing thing about the project that, you know, um, they've trusted such young architects. And, um, you know, we had these meetings um, with the client and with officials from the, um, with the town and it was amazing, you know, they spoke very little English, but they said things to us like, you know, we believe in you, you're number one. I mean, we're so used to being beat up all the time here, you know, and it's, that's amazing. Why, why can't people trust younger architects and, you know, put their faith in design? It's a funny question because um, there was no you know, there was no kind of watering down um, of design intent, as long as you were on budget, right? The comments that we got were very, very blunt, very direct. Either you were on budget or you, or you weren't, or your concept needed to be clarified a little bit, right? But there was no watering down of, you know, like, say, like, you know, I, I don't think that this works or this space works. It, there was no nitpicking. So the role of the architect, you could say, was um, much greater Client. than than uh, than in typical projects because you were uh, you were in a sense the client. All the questions that Fake got about who's going to live here, who are the clients, what do they do, what do they want, they were all responded in the same vague way. Basically, you know, make a house that you want. You're the client, so. It really puts you in a you know role of responsibility and and, and 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 you know like dictating what your desires are. So in that respect, I feel like you know they are much more pure representations of what each office thinks you know is a a, a suitable house for you know this kind of client. Working on the moon. I've had a dream about working on the moon. <laughs> if you mean dream is in something that will, you know, not really happen. <laughs> this is new to me. Yeah. No, I had a, a dream about it a long time ago. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. A museum. Oh, that's, that's a realistic... Uh, a museum, uh, well, yeah. Well, it depends on whether you want your dream to come true. A museum, <laughs> a library, a school, something public. So, 